Inflicted trauma, and boy, do we have a treat for you. You're probably used to us reviewing three types of movies, horror films, action flicks, and shows by the dead gentleman. But today we're stepping out of our comfort zones and tackling an art film, a 1970s countercultural classic based on the controversial novel by none other than Gore Vidal. Ah, we're doing a Gore Vidal film? Um, Don't get so excited. Is it my birthday? We're actually going to do something on the show with some fucking class. Which one is it? Last of the Mobile Hot Shots, Posette Miloš Pinetti, Wrecked in Eigenhand? Uh, no, actually, it's Myra. Ah! Don't tell me. I want the title to pull me into the piece, like the slow, deliberate methodology of Satyricon. Ah! Damn it, another text crawl? I'm going to start a damn counting joke if this keeps up. Check that. I'm starting a counting joke. This one doesn't even have a voiceover. It's like some idiot jotted down the book's first page and filmed it. When we finally get into the film itself, we find our hero... Wait, Myron? I thought this was about Myra Breckenridge. What gives? You're confused about that? I'm more interested in why this guy is chilling out in Dr. Frankenfurter's lab in front of a bunch of Transylvanians. I'm more concerned with why Rex Reed is in this film. The guy was a film critic at the time. He actually had his own show for a while, at the movies. More to the point, he's a film critic who completely and totally panned this film in an interview with Playboy. Wait, which issue? Uh, August 1970. Wait, so this guy panned a movie he was in while it was still filming? What a douchebag! Myron, it seems, is taking a trip six inches forward and five inches back in what has to be at the least believable hospital set I've ever seen. It looks less like General Hospital and more like the Kit Kat Club. Wait a minute. That is John Carradine, late of such great films as The Grapes of Wrath, The Secret of Nim, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. No, oh, well, it's a good thing he's here. No amateur off the streets could deliver lines of this nature. You don't want inflammable tits now, do you? Three rush. I mean, and then my secret. And now the great owl just cut Myron's junk off. Lovely. Well, at least now we know where Myra comes in. I can't imagine this guy making for a very attractive lady, but... Oh, well, never mind. John Carradine is apparently the world's greatest surgeon, because he has somehow managed to transmogrify Rex Reed into Raquel Welch. Well, that is an improvement in every way imaginable. Over the next few ridiculous establishment shots, Myra dances around like a child, a moron, or possibly a childish moron, travels to Hollywood to take control of an educational facility from her uncle, and declares that her goal is the complete destruction of the American male. Holy shit. It's like this character was designed by those misandry assholes on Reddit. She's literally the radical feminist that my pastor warned me about. And don't you ever forget it, you motherfuckers. As the children say nowadays. Don't mother me. This is intolerable. We haven't been showing it much to this point, but the director has made the wonderful decision to add random pieces of stock footage that the 20th century fucks happen to own. There's a story behind that. You see, the director, Michael Sarn, was essentially untested at this point and picked for no reason other than Fox wanted someone young and hip to synthetically engineer a countercultural hipster youth film, like Midnight Cowboy or Skidoo. Unfortunately, they got exactly what they asked for. A hippie with youthful exuberance in place of common sense or experience. Long story short, Sarn took the film hundreds of thousands of dollars over budget and hung on by a contract loophole until the studio simply struck the sets and demanded a final cut, footage as is. Hence the completely nonsensical padding from other movies used in a sad, vain attempt to drag the picture out to a theater-length runtime. Oh, Michael, you poor bastard. If you'd only come 40 years later, you could have directed for Tim and Eric. Myra has bullied her uncle into a teaching position for a very lucrative $1,000 a month. Keep in mind that this is the 70s. And taken over instructing his students in posture and empathy. She's apparently appalled by her uncle's business practices. Nobody ever leaves. 
students. I've been here for 14 years. I don't teach, I'm a student. You see, Meyer, we uh, try to build up the confidence of the students so they don't want to leave. That right? That don't sound right. That's terrible. Hmm, perpetual college. I'm not sure if that would be heaven or hell. Come to think of it, it's actually impossible. No human's liver could withstand that level of punishment. Myra intends to completely change all of that. She finds his methods to be an affront to motion picture, song, and the arts in general. Also, she thinks that speeches like this are a part of posture and balance. A mimetic pantomime in which he saw straight through the strenuous clowning to the hard fact that American women are eager for men to rape them, and vice versa. And that in every American there is a strangler longing to break a neck during orgasm. I mean to have my masseuse come in at five instead of six as I'm getting horny watching my niece on TV. In addition to all the other bizarre or irreverent elements, the film is run through with Myron, who is still a little thing in Myra's head. From time to time, we see Myron playing the role of a passive observer, simply amused at Myra's childish antics. At other times, we see him offering advice, and sometimes we see him engaging in conversation with other people. This is ostensibly meant to imply that Myra has very different sides of her personality, and that a slight hint of the masculine remains. Interestingly, the masculine only seems to entail two traits, sexual aggression and confusing dialogue made of complete non sequitur. Their conversation sounds like lyrics to Japanese pop songs. We feel that it's our responsibility to... But you're a fag, aren't you? Well, uh, what do you... I don't know, I mean, in the Baha'i faith. Watch the Count of Monte Cristo with the lights off. The darkness surrounds them and becomes candles. But aren't you a cluophobic? Well, according to the guru Sri Kumare... Sometimes you use them on skin cream, but not today. Elsewhere, we have more plot allegedly developing as we introduce yet another Golden Age actress, an unflappable sex symbol, Mae West. She's playing a talent scout who tells all the young men she interviews to come up and see me sometime. Hmm, what's the best way that I can explain her role in the film? Well, let's see. Uh, don't forget to remind me of the policeman's balls. Uh, I mean the police show. Get a test on this guy. A screen test? No. Blood test. Hmm? Well, ma'am, I'm six feet seven inches. Well, <clears throat> never mind about the six feet. Let's talk about the seven inches. Mm -hmm. Basically, she exists as a walking punchline. Her design seems to imply that she's a powerful woman with a strong sense of sexual development, but the director plays it for less. As much as I want her to be a hero in this picture, she exists only to make silly sex jokes in a movie with this level of humor. That's not funny. The only other major characters in this movie are a pair of idiot hillbillies named Rusty and Mary Ann. Myron is strangely obsessed with Mary Ann and Myra with Rusty. Rusty's apparently in excellent physical shape, but clearly is about as stupid as a room full of low-income objectivists. Also, he's played by Roger Heron. Wait, who? Nobody, because he was so traumatized by making of this picture that he gave up acting and he never stepped into the frame again! That, however, isn't the only problem that Myra has with the couple. Mary Ann, it seems, is, well... She is mentally retarded. I guess that's one way to put it. Another way is that she's a dumb kid who doesn't know what the hell Myra is talking about when she starts pulling out her vintage records and whinging on like an aging cynic about how they were true and pure and no one could hope to roll the barrel back that they pushed out. Well, I scarcely dared mention Ella Mae Morris in the Cow Cow Boogie. The rest of the movie is basically a repeating reel show, not unlike YouTube poop. They pretty much just cycle through more obnoxious jokes, inappropriate stock footage, and nonsense that is meant to sound like forward thinking, but is generally entirely backwards. Meanwhile, Rusty does something off camera that violates his parole, and Myra takes it upon herself to get him out of jail. She does so by pitching his praises to Letitia Van Allen, in the hopes that she'll use her considerable influence to spring him. No pun intended. And speaking of prison-based tropes, we should probably talk about the most notorious scene in the film. For the second time, Myra gets Rusty all to herself, and through a combination of false pretenses and legal threats, forces him to engage in a laundry list of humiliating acts before she... There's no delicate way for me to put this. She rapes him. 
Seriously. She ties him to a table and uses a piece of equipment to forcibly violate the poor man. This isn't the first time that a man or a woman has been shown in such a position, but there's a distinction to be drawn here between, say, this and American History X. And that distinction is that this is played completely for laughs. Now, we can't show you much of this footage, and there's no real way to understand how really disturbing the sequence is without actually experiencing it. Your manhood was taken by Errol Flynn and Clark Gable. I am only going to supply you uh, with the finishing touches. Oh, God! I reckon none of you northern folks ever heard of Texas Callahan making love to his gal. Well, you're going to hear it now. <laughs> Charge! God! It's not funny. No. No, it isn't. In spite of the film making a pure mockery of what it's depicting, it's not much less graphic than, say, Last House on the Left or Irreversible. There isn't any revenge sequence here, either. He just brokenly limps out of the room, pausing only to thank her for assaulting him when she demands he do so. Well, aren't you going to thank me for all the trouble I've taken? Thank you, ma'am. Myra then declares that she must conquer his girlfriend in order to have complete control over both sexes. This doesn't sound like a subversive countercultural art film. This sounds like it was written by Randall Terry, Tony Perkins, Jack Chick, Fred Phelps, and Brian Fisher. The actual climax of the film, if you can call it that, involves the jig being ostensibly up. Uncle Buck has his lawyers in, and they have found out that there is no record of Myron's death, and that the marriage certificate is a patent forgery. Hey, wait a minute. That's... that's Roger C. Carmel. He was the voice of Cyclonus, Bruticus, and the leader of the Quintessons. And Mulligan from My Little Pony. Here he is... wait, what? A dental psychiatrist? Was that a thing in the 60s? Holy shit, let's get through this. Finally, having been caught dead to rights in her lie, Myra finally admits that she was formerly Myron and shows her uncle and his lawyers her sex change scar. Thank God. I never slipped in the old Buck Loner special. This time, it's a dangerous thing, ambition. Ruined Mickey Mouse's whole career. Well, now it's eight bars and out, honey. You are no more than a Linda Darnell paper doll. A Disney cow that got over the fence. You got ambitious. You were great in Cinemascope and Technicolor, but you can't cut it in black and white. You will remember day in the desert. So Myra was hit by a car driven by Myron, except it wasn't, and this has all been a dream. God damn it! Myron wakes up and discovers himself titless and betesticled, as his sex change was never a real thing. As it turns out, they've Mario 2'd our asses, and the whole thing was a fever dream. What? What was the point? Why would they undermine the entire narrative like this? Well, Rex Reed told Playboy that he was so appalled by the idea of playing a homosexual man who becomes a woman that he had his agent work a clause into his contract that allowed him script approval. The entire sequence was added to ensure that he wouldn't actually have to play the role that he auditioned and did callbacks for. When it comes to it, that is a metaphor for the entire movie. So what are our thoughts? This, this, I guess I technically have to call it a film, fails on every possible level. In a way, it's a study in contrasts. It's an utterly artless art film. It's ostensibly a comedy, yet it contains no actual humor. But more than anything else, it's a film that's trying to make a statement, yet has nothing meaningful or intelligible to say. Oh, it's trying to make some sort of point about gender roles and sexuality and how they influence human interaction, but it never quite gets there. I've admittedly never read Gore Vidal's novel, but any relevance or truth it may have contained is lost amid the clumsy innuendo, the half-realized story, the one-note insulting caricatures that pretend to be characters, and all the blatant, blatant padding. Oh lord, the padding. A hundred certain mattresses don't contain a tenth this much padding. <laughs> Laurel and Hardy have almost as much screen time in this thing as Rex Reed does. <laughs> in fact, this film might actually serve some useful purpose after all. I think all would-be filmmakers should be forced to watch it at some point. 
preferably just as they're entering their most irritating hipster phase. This way, it can serve as a painful lesson on how to avoid the overuse of inappropriate, seemingly random stock footage and how to perceive the fine line between art and pretentious idiocy. As an added bonus, any that miss the point can be preemptively put down before they have the chance to inflict a Myra Breckenridge of their own on the world at large. See? Everybody wins. When faced with a movie like Myra Breckenridge, you can really only draft one response. Why? Why is this a movie? <laughs> Myra is full of high-profile actors and actresses, and it shits all over all of them just for fun. It comes off as mean-spirited where they're concerned. It makes them into mockeries. I'm not going to lie, I can stomach this way easier than I can stand Space Zombie Bingo, but that doesn't make it a good film by any stretch of the imagination. The dialogue makes zero sense 90% of the time, and no one looks happy to be there. Michael Sarn clearly dropped all of the drugs, as well as the ball, when stapling this piece of shit together. Myra Breckenridge is brilliant. Its progressively honest and avant-garde approach to human sexuality is both enriching and enlightening, and it can be used to replace an entire bookshelf on both feminist theory and queer philosophy. Is what I would be saying if we had been reading the book by Gore Vidal and not watching this piece of horse shit. The manner by which this movie handles non-traditional gender roles and feminist theory is so reckless and uninformed that it truly comes across like a threatening lesson from a chick tract. Don't end up like poor Rusty who fell in with a den of communist pinko faggots because he was raped by a woman and transformed into a sexual vampire. He can never be a real man again. This movie's views on sexuality are so old that it's in danger of falling asleep in its rocking chair and drowning in its own saliva. I honestly never thought that we would do a movie on this show with a lower view of homosexuals than the newly deads, and at least that had Captain Mike. What did you have, Myra Breckenridge? Nothing. What a bomb. Looks like that's the end of today's show. Hopefully you've enjoyed our mockery of this terrible film more than we enjoyed having to watch it over and over and over again. If you've enjoyed our review, you can subscribe to see more like it and tell your friends. Until next time, this has been Film Inflicted Trauma. my oppa noise. That I means was gonna I have say, to get up and fly away. Say, are, you, are, you, are you flying to the, you know, the earth name? Wait a minute. <laughs> Babe, come back. What? Camera wasn't on. <laughs> what? Camera wasn't on. Are you shitting me? <laughs> I am not. God damn it! What is with today? <laughs> <laughs> it's hot and I hate it. <laughs> Actually, it may not have been on for any of that. <laughs> Try not to let the vent anger show. Oh, I'm good at that. Okay. Three. She lives with me. Three. <laughs> shut up! I'm not doing it. Shush! Let me put I'm a not double check on that camera. Oh, I just Encino manned you. I hope you can deal with that. Alright. Three. This is how I deal with Encino man. <laughs> <laughs>